All right, welcome back. And now it is time for something completely different. So we're going to talk about programming paradigms, which is good to understand, but uh, it can be a bit dry. So just prepare yourselves. Uh, I've tried to include as many memes as I can possibly include just to make it a bit more fun. So let's talk about the software development lifestyle. I know that's something you're dying to know, but we're going to talk about it. And thanks a whole lot to Bill Kearney for these slides. Uh, I, I definitely stole from him these next two sections quite a bit. Uh, so thank you, Bill. And let us let us get started. So let's pretend somebody gives you a million dollars and they tell you to take a year and go make this software with you and your team. And this is what I want. Give it to me. OK, that's your budget. That's your timeline. What do you do now is the next question. And there are ways, there are a bunch of different competing ways to go and figure out, OK, uh, I have to get this done. How am I going to do it? How am I going to plan? How am I going to execute my plan? And I guess you're kind of doing this on a very small scale, right, when you're doing your labs. Uh, I guess this is probably the things you should think about. Now I'm going to put them in words, okay? Things that you may have been doing and maybe you haven't been doing, in which case you should probably start. Okay, so this is a software development life, sci life cycle. And uh, traditionally, this is the order in which they occur. So here's the steps that you do, their traditional order and, uh, and time frame. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do when somebody gives you a million dollars and you, you need to make some software for them, you, you have a year, uh, is you need to figure out what in the world you're writing. Okay, so you have to gather requirements, you have to analyze them, uh, figure out what your customer is actually wanting. Okay, because maybe uh, you didn't get enough information, maybe you need to meet with the customers that are actually going to use this software. You need to talk to people, okay? You don't think about talking to people as something that a, a programmer's job is, but uh, especially customers. But that is exactly what needs to happen here, okay? So the first thing that needs to happen is you need to figure out, hey, what am I actually doing? Okay, so uh, you're analyzing your requirements. That's the first step. Then, uh, after you kind of understand that you need, you're going to figure out what you need. You're going to figure out use cases, like how is this software going to be used, okay? Eh, not bold, unitalicized. Like, okay, I'm going to need some buttons because the user's going to want to press this button to get into this mode to uh, then start doing this. Okay, these are the use cases, and you're going to write out all of them. Okay, all the things that your customer says that they're going to need and that they're want, going to want to do with this software, whatever it may be. Okay, then you're going to start designing what the software needs to look like. Oh, in this first step, it's going to take about two months, in fact. It's going to be, I guess, one sixth of the time, usually. This does take a while to do, to figure out, like ask the customer, because sometimes they don't know what they want, right? Uh, this is very philosophical. Uh, then you, you spend the next two months, so another like one sixth of the time process uh, to actually go and figure out, okay, this is the code that I'm going to write, okay? I need to design and specify everything that will be written by any programmer. Okay, that's gonna take two more months. This is the design phase, okay? Hopefully you're doing this when you write your lab, you're designing how you're going to implement it, right? So you're going to write down, again, using words. You don't think that programmers are like people people, but they are. They have to be. Software engineers have to be. You write down exactly what the code does and uh, every single function in class. Like you got to write so much documentation. Uh, every single function in class and other thing that your language supports, you have to figure out all of that, okay? so. I need this function x because this customer wants to do y in use case z, okay? That's the idea. It's a lot of work. Uh, and I need to package it up in this class because it'll make it easier to think about as, the, as all of our programmers work, okay? This is from a team's point of view all this time, uh, okay? So you need to figure out what you need, uh, what it'll do, and make sure that it's actually like making, like, progress towards these use cases to this idea that the customer has in their mind. Okay, so you have to plan out that, therefore, like how, how the code works with itself, because eventually you're going to give this to multiple people, right? You're going to have teams. Okay, 
Uh, let's see if I can fit this. Because multiple people. There we go. That'll work. Uh, so you need to know very clearly ahead of time because multiple people are going to be working like in separate desks, like maybe separate locations. So we're all working from home now, right? Everybody needs to know exactly what they're going to do. So this all has to be documented exactly. Okay, specified exactly. And then finally, you get to write the code. Okay, you get to send your programmers off to go and write the code and pray that they do everything properly, like they, they followed the specifications correctly. That is the implementation phase. And notice this right here. This is what I want to make very, very clear and apparent. This is only three months out of the 12. Okay, this is a quarter of your time is spent writing code. That is not the majority of the time. Okay, that is that may come as a shock because right now maybe you're just writing a bunch of code trying to make the deadline, but that is not how the world works. This uh, this is a very like this is the process that is quite quick. Okay, this is one of the things that doesn't take hold a whole lot of time or as much as you would think. Okay, so you're actually going to write code for not as much of the time, and uh, you're going to spend equally as much time testing the code. And I know that's not what hap happens right now uh, when you are uh, programming your labs. And that's because of the way that I've designed them, of course. But in the real world, uh, you are making money to do a certain thing. And you need to ensure that you have done that thing. Okay, so another quarter of your time is spent testing your software. Okay, uh, I guess technically maybe you are testing as you write your code because I've written some tests for you. Maybe you're like submitting or writing the, the testing functions. Uh, it's a good idea to test as much. And this is what happens in the real world, testing as much as you write the code. Okay, so you're making sure uh, and you're, you're testing from different levels. Okay, different levels of testing. You've got like, uh, you've got unit testing to test little tiny pieces. So to make sure that each individual function uh, slash flash is doing the right thing. You'll use unit testing for that. Uh, and then you'll do like uh, what's known as integration testing to make sure that everybody's working together properly because maybe like class A does one thing but it requires class B to like play a part in it. So uh, you need to make sure that they're going to hook in to each other properly and do the right thing together. Uh, and then finally you got to make sure that the poll program works at the high, at the highest level, like a user can actually go in and click things. Uh, another thing that does happen, like is, uh, and I'll talk about in the debugging process, is like you're going to make changes eventually, and those changes might break more things, and uh, you have to do what's known as regression testing to make sure that new things that you implement or things that you fix. If, I, if only I could spell testing. Make sure that new things that you fix don't break old things that were already okay, but now they're not. So make sure that the program like can actually be used by a user, like people can click through it and do the right stuff, and all these use cases have been correctly implemented. So at this point, you've got working software. Okay, you've got a prototype. Proto-type, I guess can't fit it all in the same line. So you've got a prototype at this point, and uh, then you have two months left, two-ish months left. So you need to give it to the customer now, because uh, at the end of 12 months, you can't just say, okay, yes, I, got, I made the thing for you, here you go, uh, because it's very, very likely that they didn't know what they wanted, and maybe after they see what they get, they have more requirements, okay? So that's the idea. So you're going to give it to the customer and they're going to tell you like, oh, yes, this is good. This sucks. Uh, please add this. Uh, usually it's not, please take this away. It's usually always add stuff. They want more. Okay. And then you try and work on that, like get it working as fast as you can maybe. Uh, but there's probably not enough time. And then you debug. Okay. Debugging is the last thing. This is where regression testing fits in. 
eventually, like, your program is not going to be perfect. The software that you're writing is never going to be perfect the first time. Uh, you're going to catch a lot of it in the testing phase, sure, but uh, people actually using the code as they want to use it, uh, the customer is going to find a lot of the bugs, okay, and you're going to then go and fix them, okay, so they're going to, like, be triaged, and you're going to figure out, okay, let us spend our most amount of time on this in the time that we have left, things like that. So you'll fix those bugs, and then you'll also implement the features, because the customer is going to want more stuff, and uh, essentially, uh, those two things, not just the last, the entire cycle, it restarts with uh, all this stuff. Can I move this up and this up? There we go. So the entire cycle restarts with these new features and these bugs that you need to implement. Those are more things that you need to do. Okay, so uh, these last two bits are the evolution phase. And then remember that it's a cycle. It keeps starting over again. Again, you have new things that you need to implement. Maybe that either they were bad things that happened last time or new things that the customer wants. Again, you need to figure out what you need to do for those. Design them, implement them, test them. And then there, there will be more bugs. There will be new things that the customer wants because humans want new things, right? Uh, it's all very philosophical and weird, but that is that is software development. This is, this is what your future may be if you're interested in this field. So I just want to give you a taste of it. Uh, Usually, they have different people to do these things. So, like, if you don't like talking to customers, you don't have to do that part. Maybe you can just be working on code for uh, as much as you want. But if you are more of a people person and you're concerned about whether or not CSI is for you, uh, notice that there is definitely room for you. Okay? Definitely, definitely. So, uh, I hope that this shows you that there are options in the field. Uh, more than you might be aware of. So that is a very big slide, and that is the software development lifecycle. And this is the traditional order, okay? It's not the order that, uh, well, I guess it is the order, but this time frame is not, I guess, usually the time frame these days, okay? There are, there's different ways of programming software, and that leads us to the next section, okay? Programming paradigms, so ways to think about programming. Uh, and the first one is called Waterfall, and uh, everybody, like, just to, just to lead you into this, if you ever take a software engineering class, everybody's going to say bad things about Waterfall. Uh, this is, like, considered to be old, and silly, and not what you want anymore behind the times, okay? Uh, but it may still have a place, and it has a place still in, like, very, very critical software, okay? Uh, so it's still being used, and it does have a place. With all of these that I'm about to show you, there are just a ton of trade-offs. And it's up to your managers, to your, like, CEOs, to whoever's in charge to figure out which paradigm works best for your company. Okay, so the first one is Waterfall, and Waterfall is do all of those previous steps in order with the same time frame. Okay, so uh, dedicate just that same amount of time, do all this stuff in order. So uh, the pros, I think one obvious one is that, okay, yes, requirements, specification, design, actually code, test, that's one very tiny box for testing, but that is, uh, that is waterfall in a, in a nutshell. It's like, uh, there's water, it's falling, and whichever, like, time has passed, and the water is now falling on the next section, okay, when enough time has passed. So now we need to start the testing phase, because waterfall says so. It goes in order. It's all just tumbling down, all right? So, one nice thing is everything's planned out, it's all specified, you know exactly what you're going to do, you know exactly what the programmers need to do. Uh, the cons, unfortunately, there are a lot, okay? So there are quite a few cons here, and uh, I guess 
the the main one is that this is just not flexible. Uh, you suddenly have to start like, okay, I gotta do requirements before like designing my code and actually doing code. Uh, that's the order that this needs to happen and it cannot change. And like, okay, the user gives me a new requirement while I'm in the coding phase. I just say, nope, we're gonna wait till the next round for that. That your customer probably won't like that, uh, first of all. But it's just not flexible sometimes. Uh, another thing is, uh, it all comes down to the fact that it's not flexible, by the way. Uh, another issue is that, okay, the customer has no clue what they want usually. Until they see it in action, until they actually get the product, like down here, they, they see the prototype and, okay, yes, this was what we wanted, or no, this actually wasn't what we wanted. Now we know better what we do want. So until they have something in their hands, they have no clue like whether or not this is going to work. Uh, and then, again, it all comes down to the fact that this is not flexible. Uh, when you are in the coding phase, like you're, you're implementing, you have already designed, which means you cannot change the design. So you got your programmers down in the trenches. Might notice that something needs to change. But you've already planned everything out in the design phase. You can't change anything. You can't change it. Uh, so that that's the idea with Waterfall. There are a few problems, but it has its place. Like in mission critical software, where you need to know exactly like you need to spend months years in the in the design phase like you're planning your mars rover you're planning a like an autopilot for for a plane sometimes you want to spend a lot of time in the design phase and you don't want to trust the programmers to figure new things out later like we want it all figured out right now because people's lives are at stake uh, waterfall has its place in society in programming in software engineering uh, but yeah this is not always the best idea and so people have reacted to Waterfall. Waterfall is like the old like behemoth, like think of like IBM in, in the heyday. Like everybody thinks that this is out of style. And so they've reacted against it and tried to do new things. Okay, and the, the leading paradigm, I would say these days is agile or a form of agile programming. Okay, so, uh, Here's the first meme. Okay, uh, the idea is agile. It goes through the same cycle. Like you're doing the same stuff. You're figuring out your requirements. You're designing the code, implementing the code. You're testing the code and figuring out what you need for the next cycle. But instead of taking a year, you split it up into much smaller chunks, like a month long chunk, for example, which has all of those phases in one. So it's a much faster to get things out the door. Uh, like suddenly you have something ready at the end of whatever your short cycle is, your small chunk, maybe it's a month, maybe it's two weeks. So uh, the obvious pro is clients can immediately see results. And oh man, do they like that. So this is why it's one of the like leading ways of doing things nowadays. Your client can get your prototype a much earlier than it would have been given to them in Waterfall. They can see what it's doing, figure out what's going wrong, figure out what needs to change, and also change their minds. And it's not the end of the world anymore because you haven't spent a million hours like designing this thing. You can just, okay, start the cycle over again. Let's try again. Okay. Uh, some of the cons are that because the cycle is so short, uh, the design phase keeps happening and so all your programmers might want to be like oh yes this brand new thing just came out this month i'm gonna i'd like to try that please when it's not like battle tested or something so that's one thing that could happen uh also uh it's a bit more stressful on humans because like you are now meeting deadlines that are much shorter whereas you had before three months to like test the code three months to actually write the code 
maybe you have to squeeze all of that testing and implementation into a couple weeks, into a month now. Uh, and that just like makes more deadlines happen and that becomes more stressful for people, uh, which makes sense. So that's a con. And so you've heard horror stories about some companies like uh, the one that's in my mind is like Amazon is really good at making their programmers very stressed out all the time. It's a bad place to work, or maybe it used to be. Uh, and this is one of the reasons. Okay, but Agile is, uh, at least from the client's perspective, the person you're actually doing this for, uh, Agile is totally the way to go, right? And a lot of the time it works good for the programmers too. Uh, so the mantra for Agile is you release quickly and you release often. Okay, so you're going to get something out the door as fast as humanly possible so that it, it breaks as fast as possible and you can just restart the cycle and get it working again. So you're going to use that feedback from your client uh, after you release really quickly and things are broken and you use that to drive the next cycle. So you're going to go back and do all this stuff over again uh, with some more information now, with a better idea of what you need to do. Okay, uh, which one was I on? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, there it is. So, uh, yeah, cycles are around a month, give or take a couple weeks, uh, usually in Agile. Uh, some are as short as like two weeks for some some kinds of Agile, uh, but a month is, is a normal amount of time, and so it's really fast to give things to the, to the clients now. Uh, and then, one thing that Agile is known for and this is why it could potentially be seen as stressful, is they call like each little cycle uh, a sprint, uh, where like the whole team is working together on this one new feature, uh, getting it working like with the rest of the code base, getting it tested, and giving it to the client to make sure that it's actually what they wanted and to get their feedback, uh, and to generate requirements for the next cycle. Uh, they call those things sprints, okay? So it's like, okay, uh, like, let's get ready for the next sprint. And so this is like, if only they were to call this something else, I guess, then it would be a bit less uh, stressful sounding, right? We don't want to sprint, we want to jog. So that is agile in a nutshell. It's like, you're agile, you're moving around. Uh, it's a nice way of, of doing things. So uh, let's compare, because agile was a reaction to waterfall. Uh, waterfall, it's trying to predict the future and say, okay, uh, I think we're going to need this. I'm going to program it this way. This is my design. I'm pretty sure this is all going to work out. We thought a whole lot. Uh, we, we thought a long time about this. So it's all going to hook together. But maybe that's not what the client wanted. Okay? It's attempting to predict the future. But Agile is more about, uh, like, okay, let's, th let's talk about the now. Let's, let's take what the, the client thinks they want. Let's implement that really quickly. Uh, to get something working, something small, and let's make sure that's what they wanted. Responding quickly to the present. That's the idea. Okay, and uh, this would be the time in class where I would pause this, have you guys discuss, like, okay, which one which one makes more sense? And I think I have, like, successfully poisoned your minds enough to come up with the answer, but the question is why? Like, can you give a good, a good reason? Uh, a good argument that I haven't given yet. And so... Uh, the reason is, uh, just from raw data, one of the reasons that Agile wins is that it is over double, like over 200% usually, more likely to result in success, project success. Which, what does project success mean? It's, it's like, okay, yes, we gave it to the customer, it was on time, uh, it was what they wanted. And uh, versus Waterfall, where uh, I guess, take this percentage and divide by one, uh, and, or like flip it, and now you get what what was wrong there, okay? So waterfall versus agile, most people these days are gonna choose agile, okay? So uh, if you go work at a company, they're gonna have some kind of agile method usually, and at the internships that I did in industry, this is exactly what happened, everybody was using agile. All right, or some like features of it. So here's a cool graph form that shows you what's going on. 
uh, here's waterfall over here and agile over here and uh, these numbers you know what successful means now you are given like you gave this thing back to the customer it was exactly what they wanted it was done on time with all with our a million dollars that we got at the very beginning we didn't have to ask for any more uh, it was all perfect so notice that failure is much less common okay much less common that like it just didn't work out at all like the the customer goes and finds somebody new to, pr to program this stuff maybe they go and find an agile group to go and work on this uh, and successful goes from 14 to 42 percent oh man is that different okay and uh, so now you can see the reasons for using waterfall or sorry for, for using agile rather than waterfall and challenged uh, they're about the same, probably, within statistical error or close to it. Uh, challenged, I guess it's slightly less for Agile, but uh, challenged just means it's over budget or over time, but like the client's still like, yeah, we want this, we understand that uh, our requirements changed, we, we added stuff, uh, so we're going to pay you some more money to like implement all these new things that we decided we needed. Uh, which is not the, the worst thing in the world, but obviously every client wants to see successful projects that don't cost too much and agile is definitely the way to go there okay so uh, hopefully I have convinced you that agile is a good thing uh, waterfall has its places and uh, even if you're using waterfall like you work at a company that has like mission critical stuff or like uh, government grants or things that need to be done in a certain way you might want to integrate pieces of agile development into your waterfall method and that might make your life easier so one really nice thing and i'm going to spend some time on it is called scrum so scrum is a subtype of agile it's a subclass of agile uh, and so it does everything agile does but it has its own extra secret sauce and it's a bit weird sounding but that's okay uh, so it's just a very popular form of Agile. In fact, Scrum is something, their features of Scrum were taken uh, and used at every internship that I had, okay? Everybody likes their Scrum. And so uh, I guess the first thing is you need to figure out what does it mean for you to like be ready to deliver something? What's your definition of done? Uh, and maybe it's something simple like, okay, yes, it passes all the tests that we wrote something like that and uh, so you need to come up with a definition for each little thing that you need to do is what does it mean for that thing to be done okay to be defined as being done that's the idea uh, then what you do is you generate what's known as a backlog which uh, holds what you still need to do okay all the new features like they just pile up in your backlog Boop. got a bunch of things like and also you need to figure out how long they take okay uh, you give them a priority like this one this one's super high I'm gonna color them green we need to get these done first because they're mission critical all right the rest are like okay it's, it'd be nice to have them but the client really wants these two things right now okay so you're all gonna give them a priority, a risk, like, okay, if what's the risk of us not getting this out? Like, maybe we should have more people work on it so that everybody can see, like, okay, we need to dedicate ourselves to this particular task because it's gonna be hard, it's gonna take time, and it's high priority. Uh, and then you also estimate the de development time, which is really hard to do, but uh, you try, okay? And then, there's a special person called the product owner and they pretend to be the client like they're the voice of the client uh, they they generate the backlog and the priorities like maybe they actually meet with the real client but they're like they're like an actor okay they pretend to be the client and all the the goings on for scrum okay they generate the backlog and the priorities so you you have somebody like a people person perhaps to to go and do this stuff and then then we have what's what is known as the scrum master which is hilarious uh, so the scrum master just guides the rest of the team through the scrum process 
and they they make sure that like nobody's getting in the way they make sure that like okay yes the ceo of the company is happy and the developer so that the developers don't have to like meet all day long because who wants to be in a meeting uh so sprints so here's that word again they're a little uh in scrum they like to have usually two week sprints maybe a month long sprint again this is agile plus or minus a couple weeks but sometimes uh, it's as short as two weeks and there are planning events which can be long take a while and the highest priority tasks are taken off the list and that becomes your backlog okay you have a bunch of tasks that you need to do and then you suddenly generate from those tasks oh no the the backlog of things okay that's the idea and then this is the key this is probably the coolest thing uh this even if teams don't do scrum they usually steal this idea from it and this is definitely always the case uh, it's a very popular thing to do uh, you have 15 minute daily meetings super duper short at the start of each day until the end of the sprint uh, this is where like you hold you everybody gets held accountable like every member says what they did the day before like this is what I worked on this is what I'm gonna do today and this is what's in my way right now this is some challenges that I've been facing so that maybe we can rearrange all of the uh, workforce and to, to, to help you out maybe and like to rearrange the backlog maybe this is really gonna take more time now that we've started working on it and we know it needs to be done uh, we have a better idea and so people love to steal this idea, even if they're not doing Scrum. This 15-minute daily meeting is super short, and it's usually the only one that a developer has to go to. So it like doesn't waste a lot of time, and everybody knows what they're doing and what other people are doing. It's really nice. Uh, so yeah, everybody's just working through that backlog uh, with a certain priority level each day, completing those tasks. And yeah, that's that's Scrum in a, in a nutshell. Uh, this is a nice diagram. So you're going to get like you're going to make a backlog of all the things that the customer wanted that's your product backlog and then for each little sprint that you choose which can be two weeks it could be a month this diagram it's uh considered to be a month each day you're working on stuff you're meeting like stand-up meeting and uh you're running your sprint and then you deliver something to the to the user to like to go and and look at and make sure it's all working Okay, so that's Scrum in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, so at the end of each cycle, you get together and make sure that like everything's still on track, like see what went well, like how can we improve this stuff for next time? And again, of course, the customer gets something. So uh, uh, as I was saying with those two 15-minute uh, meetings, everything is super short. Like everybody like understands that everybody else's time is valuable, and so all these scrum meetings are quite short and like if the timer is up like we're just gonna walk out of the room that's the idea for scrum so it's making sure that everybody is happy uh, and they're not having their time wasted okay so uh, finally let's talk about a burn down chart uh, this is like the major thing behind scrum like everybody's working on a, s a sprint and here are all the tasks that I need to do that need to be done still like and they have been measured in hours and it would be nice like in a linear fashion like the last final day of the sprint this is a, apparently a three-week sprint in this case uh, on the final day like everything like there's nothing left to be done okay but uh, so you have your ideal th curve you have uh, the amount of things still left like you also have the remaining tasks on the same axis on the other side things like that uh, and the remaining effort to be done in terms of hours so everybody's looking at this they all have this chart sitting in front of them they can go to it on the website somewhere or something and everybody's working together to, to bring this down to the last day to have nothing left to do that's the idea so that is scrum in a nutshell it's agile so it has the pros and cons of agile it's just a certain way of doing things okay uh, the final one is TDD and I've talked about this a little uh, before but TDD stands for test driven development. So uh, notice like agile scrum, they all work from the same idea where implement first, then test. T 
TDD is like, nope, nope, I know what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the exact opposite. So they swap the testing phase and the coding phase. What? Uh, and it actually sometimes works. Uh, what you do is you write the tests before you write the code, and they're all going to fail initially, of course. Right? So right before you start implementing everything, all the tests are colored red, if you have like a color software for your tests. And uh, the more things that you implement, your tests start turning green. So, uh, and then eventually it's going to be like, oh yeah, this all works now. All the tests pass. So the whole idea for writing tests before you write code, uh, the mentality is that you get to figure out how this software, like you get to figure out how the functions slash classes are going to be used. Okay, because in a test you have to use them. You have to check against what you expect them to do. So you're going to use these things that aren't ready yet in a test. And that will guide you as you implement. That's the idea. Okay. That is the, uh, that's the idea behind test-driven development. And uh, not a whole lot of companies are on board with this. Uh, it's a bit of a different process, but as a student, I think you should definitely give this a try because it, it will be very helpful for, for your academic career, if, not, if nothing else, uh, in computer science. So uh, yeah, you're going to start out with no tests passing, then you're going to eventually turn some more green, pass them all, and then eventually you're, you've gotten them all to fat, the pass, and uh, maybe your code is ugly looking, like you just got all the tests to work and nothing else. So then you start refactoring your code, if you've heard that word before. You just clean it up, you, you give it some documentation, some comments and things, uh, and then you're done. Uh, then, you, then you start uh, planning the next feature and its tests. And so the cycle goes for it, red, green, refactor, and then you go back to, to red with new tests. New features to be implemented. So that's TDD, and uh, yeah. The pros are, hey, you write a good enough test suite, you can make sure that like everything's working. Like it's very hard to convince programmers to write tests. So if you're just doing it first, like that is beautiful, right? Uh, also, if you break something, usually you have your code in some kind of version control. So like uh, think of it as like a Dropbox for, or Google, Google Drive for your code. Uh, a lot of people are using Git nowadays, if you heard of that. Uh, so yeah, usually you have a previous version that you can immediately go back to if you break something. So you get to be brave. That's what TDD is all about. You can be brave and just try and make things work. Uh, some of the cons are, uh, there's more than one. It can take a long time to run tests. Like that's a lot of code to run each time you want to rebuild your code. Like you've made something, you've made some changes. Uh, also, there are blind spots that can, can appear very easily because usually the same programmer is the one writing the tests for the thing that they're about to implement. So they could unsuccessfully write the, the program and have, a, have the wrong idea in their mind as to how the program should work. And so that means their tests will f have the same blind spots. They might pass, but they might not be the right tests. Okay. Uh, and then also you need to keep updating the tests as the code changes, like you write more things, like these the requirements have changed. You need to change potentially the tests that you've written, whereas uh, implement first, test later, you don't have that problem because like you know what you have. You know what you need to test now. Uh, and then finally, it, I mean this is a problem for every everybody, but you can't test an experience. You can't test a game uh, easily with just like automated tests. You can't test a graphical user interface very easily. Like be like, okay yes, please click this box, uh, this should be blue now. That's ha really hard to do. I guess it's technically possible, but it's hard to do. Uh, so before we go, let's actually write some code for this lecture. Uh, let's let's do TDD. Uh, let's make a, t a set third bit and a, an is third bit set function. Okay, so we know how to do that now. So let's make that happen. All right, uh, a lot of talking for this lecture. So vim tdd.cpp make it work. So I'm going to write two functions and they're going to be stubs right now. So I'm going to start out as stubs. So now that you know all about TDD, we're going to do this uh, one last time. Write all these tests. Uh, 
So what, what were they called? Set third bit and is third bit set. Let me just copy, copy these words. Boop. So th set third bit is going to take a number and set it. So like take an int reference and set that thing. Uh, is third bit set is going to like tell us whether or not a bit of a number was set. I guess we don't need a reference for that one. Uh, and so it'll return back true or false if it was set or if it was not set. So let's have stubs now to do nothing. So alternatively, I could, re could have returned false. So now let's make tests for these. Okay, let's make our assert true function. Uh, you know what? Let's, I'm going to be very lazy. There's, there's actually a uh, C assert library that I've never used in this class before, but it has an assert function, which takes one Boolean. And it'll like stop the program if it fails. Uh, okay, so here are my tests. Uh, you know, I probably don't want this actually, because I don't want it to stop the program. Let's 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 do our void assert true. Be like if b see out uh, past description. And then we need string. Just to get us ready for the for the lab, I'm gonna make these unsigned ints. Just so that we're not afraid of them. They're just numbers that can't be negative. That's all. So here is my number. Uh, I don't know. Int x equals. Let's see. Let's let's start writing some tests now. So I guess let's make three tests to begin with. So I don't know. I think three is plenty for now. Uh, that's probably all we need. Uh, so this will be void. And so what do we want to happen? Oops. Well, eventually we're going to be calling assert true after we build some stuff up. We're like, okay, let's start out with zero. The third bit of zero should definitely not be set right now, yeah? So assert true not is third bit set x. Oh, not assert true. That's the idea. So that's uh, that's one thing, and then maybe uh, if we start with it unset and we set it, then it should be set. <laughs> I hope that made sense. Like, okay, it starts out as zero. Let's set it, and now it should be set. Yeah. And I don't know, let's make up a third test now. Let's be like, okay, uh, setting it twice uh, should still work. That's the idea. Maybe it, maybe it was flipping it accidentally. And uh, this test will make sure that if it was just flipping it, it would be, uh, again, failed, a failed test. So uh, let's run our tests. One, two, three. Um, yeah, these are all unimplemented, but they will compile. <coughs> Excuse me. So we actually get a couple to pass, but one of them fails, which is good. So uh, technically, sh these should all be failing, but. Uh, our functions are very simple. So uh, 
let's now get them to work. Let's get, uh, maybe let's get is third bit set to work properly. And we'll just say, hey, return, well, is x and one shifted left by three non-zero. That's the idea. Technically, you don't have to include the unequal to zero because uh, it'll convert any non-zero number to true. Just remember that. Uh, okay, so that should work. Whee. So now this one passed, and now because this one is correct, the other two are going to fail. And then we then we work on that. Okay, got some some greens and some reds. Let's make them all green now. Uh, so I'll just say uh, x equals x. Or, or to set, remember, uh, like, uh, let's actually do it incorrectly. Let's do XOR so that it will uh, incorrectly set that bit. Okay, so right now it's incorrect. Uh, dun, dun, dun. So now it'll set it once, if you call it once, but it'll flip it. It's actually flipping the third bit right now. So the first two will pass, because it does set it, uh, but really it's flipping it, so if you do it twice, it'll fail. Ooh, that's nice. It'll fail if you do that. So this needs to be or, and now I think we're going to have some all green, and we can have confidence. If we run enough tests, we can be confident uh, that it's going to work properly. That should be after setting it twice. Okay, I'm happy. Uh, yeah, that's TDD in a nutshell, and that's that's all I got for you. So a lot of words today, a lot of like concepts uh, that was not programming. So. Uh, Maybe that's a breath of fresh air for you. I don't know, but uh, it was a bit different. So uh, some exercises before we go. Uh, I really encourage you to try out test-driven development. So uh, maybe you're already doing it in that you're running my tests on your code uh, as you go, but it would be extra, extra helpful for you to write the tests before you implement anything else at all if I'm asking you to write any tests. And if I don't ask you to write tests, you should still write them uh, because it will help you get uh, get your implementation correct faster. You'll, it'll help you to understand the real problem, I think. Uh, so that's why I think TDD is really helpful in an academic setting, if nowhere else. Uh, and then also, if you are uh, if you happen to be in a pair right now, working on your labs with somebody, uh, consider using some Scrum features, like, for example, the 15-minute daily meetings. That is probably the holy grail of programming. Uh, make sure that you're all together, and make sure that everybody knows what everybody's doing, and that uh, it's a great way to keep on track. So if you're working in a pair, I really encourage you to try that. Uh, yeah, and that's all I have for you. So, uh, yeah, I think just go over and make sure that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, we talked about two completely different things and uh, had some fun. So I will see you in your lap.